everybody is ready, we'll just go ahead and I'll introduce our speaker is uh, John Jonathan Hards from the Petrified Forest. He's uh, the archaeolog archaeologist. Uh, um, you had something else on there, the main archaeologist. I think I'm. I would consider myself just the lead archaeologist. Lead. I have a whole team of archaeologists that work for me, and I take the blame for when things go wrong. So. Okay. <laughs> well, if I can have everybody uh, mute their microphones, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, John and let him introduce himself uh, to us and then start sharing your screen. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone for coming tonight, whether it's remotely or here in person. Um, as Richard said, my name is John Hards. I'm the archaeologist or lead one up at Petrified Forest National Park, which is about, if you're not familiar, about 25 miles or so east of Holbrook. Um, which is about an hour up north of where we are now. Um, I want to especially thank uh, the Agave House chapter and Richard specifically for having me. So tonight, um, bear with me, my notes won't come up on the screen. That's okay. We can, we can get through this together. Um, it might be a little different than what you're used to hearing from other archaeologists, just in the sense that I'm a animal bone focused archaeologist. So I don't look at lithic stone tools as much. I don't look at ceramics as much. I'm interested, of course, in all those things. I don't look at rock imagery or rock art quite as much as others, but I focus on animal bones, as I said, and that takes me back where I overlap with paleontology. Okay. You want to start sharing your screen yeah. so we get to sure. get some of my stuff off here and get you up on there. And so I, I'm going to go back through a oh. few things through the timeline here, but it, mainly, I want to share with you all um, some of the earliest, earliest archaeology and some of the life forms that we had uh, in the petrified forest when the first known people were in that area. And John, while we're waiting, I want to comment about the uh, hikes that, that some of us have been on. I know Carol joined me this weekend, but um, yeah, Hunter, Hunter does a great job. And uh, Victoria adds a level of, of information that's great. Um, Priyanka was there. I mean, it's just a great team to, to spend a day with. So uh, really that, appreciate it. That is wonderful feedback. I apologize to cut in. Um, yeah, it's really Hunter's in Hunter's wheelhouse. Um, and we're really looking forward to we're bringing on two more interns and two other a uh, little bit longer term archaeologists next month. Okay. So the team will grow. And if they're half as good as Priyanka and Hunter, we'll be in good shape. Oh, yeah. 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 And then Victoria would talk about some of the um, petrified wood that was not fully petrified and how the tribes use some of the pieces from that for their jingle dresses and other costumes. And so, and then she Absolutely. found some, some fossilized clamshells. So she added a level of information that was just. In fact, I spent eight hours there, and I don't think I took any photos of petrified wood. There were just too many other things to look at and talk about that I kind of forgot where I was. So, <laughs> yeah, I understand the feeling. <laughs> I would just second what David was saying. It was really a, a, a fantastic experience to go out with that crew. And yep. learn that, that is wonderful to hear. And I will, um, we have regular meetings that are park wide, so I'll, we'll ensure that. Um, Thanks to your comments that Hunter gets a, a park-wide kudos that everyone knows about. Yes, please, please. Well, as someone mentioned, this is a beautiful, beautiful, striking photo. I cannot take credit for it. It was one of my coworkers. Um, but it shows some of the wonderful landscape out there, a petrified forest. And, you know, when we have monsoons that are healthy, more than healthy, like they were last year, we get these wonderful green um, short grass prairies that all come up and then the mesas and of course all the painted uh badlands where is the petrified forest according to that picture compared to it so that's a great question what we're looking at here is more of the northern part of the park that we would consider the painted desert but the further you go down south into the park the more you get into actual fossilized trees and more what we call the rainbow forest so Let's hope that my uh, 
I'm actually able to advance my slides. Does the space bar do it? Which right now, it's not doing. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we're having all kinds of problems. Are you able to advance my slides? No. Oh, boy. Oh. There we go. Something's up. It, it worked on my... There we go. Okay. There we go. We're there. We're, <laughs> we're all together in this. Um, uh, a little bit of it's blocked out, but I just wanted to start with showing these two different maps of where the park is. The one on the left, you see where we are positioned in northeastern Arizona, about two hours or so, two and a half hours uh, east of Flagstaff. Um, and then the map on the right is just showing some of our current distribution of archaeological sites. And you can see we have a lot. That sort of blank spot up in the up in the upper part of the green is just a lot of the painted desert that we haven't gotten to yet. Wow. Um, and then more of the cream or tan colored stuff down there in the lower left is the Fitzgerald Ranch, which is within our boundary, but we don't own it. Um, we actually did just put in a bid for it to see if they would like to sell it to us. Um, so that'll be, I think, around 40,000 more acres for us to inventory. So, the center of the map has some uh, pink. Is that part of the, the same ranch? It, well, a different ranch is we do have some in holdings. That's a great question. And then the blue blocks, if you can see those, I never know how it projects the same color, but it's yes. blue. Um, those are state uh, sections. So those sections, if you aren't familiar, are up one mile by one mile in uh, area. Why? What are they? Um, it's just how the original surveys for this state happen. The checkerboard stuff, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Because the state just has all these isolated islands that they have to go through us to get to. And then vice versa, when we're out there inventorying, we go out around <laughs> those blocks. Um, that was part I, of the, the railroad coming in. Sure. They checkerboarded the land so that is bringing in the railroad. And then there was something there historically along with the railroad too, where you had to have space that was left to have a schoolhouse or something of that sort every so often. Um, I can't see my notes, but I'll just say it now. We have just under 1,300 recorded archaeological sites, and that number is changing almost on a weekly basis. And if I go too quickly, just yell at me. And... I do like to keep these super informal, if you couldn't tell already, so don't be afraid to interrupt me. Throw your hand up and ask questions. And so origins of the park. I thought we would just start um, with the park being founded and then kind of move backward to some of those earlier sites that I was referencing. You can see this is one of the earlier uh, entrance signs showing the distances to some of the neighboring communities. And then here are some shots uh, from the early days of the park. Uh, if we go clockwise from upper left, you know, I, actually, let me pause. Has, how many people have been to Petrified Forest National Park? So most of you are fairly familiar. Yeah. I know Dave, I know Dave has. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As often as I can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so the upper left was the Painted Desert Inn under construction. And then as you move to the right where you see that little wooden shack, that's actually the first um, non-native structure ever built in the park. Uh, that's from the 19 teens. I didn't get an exact date on it. Um, it's a little bit covered up, but the upper right-hand corner is the Rainbow Forest Museum, which pretty much looks the same today. That was built in the early to mid-30s. Um, and then it's really under construction down below. Um, with the walls just barely coming into view. And then the lower left, you see some folks uh, with their early dump truck working on the park road. So is the inn open again? Or? The inn part is not. We're working on it. That the, the Painted Desert Inn has some structural issues, as I'm sure some of you uh, are aware. It sits right on the edge of a very high mesa. Um, we did, oh, it's baby steps, right? So we've reopened the ice cream parlor that is downstairs. So that's been kind of a hit. Um, and I think this was a slide too early to mention that Petrified Forest became a national monument in 1906. 
and then went on to become a national park in 1962. And I think, do you all know why it was a national monument, why it was of importance originally? All of that fossilized wood. <laughs> We've gone on to recognize that it's one of the world's foremost Triassic fossil um, research locations where we literally have drawers of brand new species um, in the park that our lead paleontologist has been finding. Um, has there, are there other sites around the globe like that? Similar. There, that's a fantastic question. There are other um, petrified forests in different places around the globe, but there aren't too many uh, area wise and density of woods. I understand that petrified forest up the road that we're talking about today is the biggest. Um, but even when it was founded, it was just thought to be just that, just fossil trees. But now we're finding all these pre dinosaurs. We have the earliest fossilized frog in North America, the earliest known crayfish in the whole world. It just, it, I'm not a paleontologist, obviously, but it blows my mind the, the things we're finding. And if you, if, as long as we're on that topic, <laughs> I swear I'll stick to archaeology <laughs> most of the time. But um, so most of those deposits from those early paleo days date to around 218 million years. No one's expected to be able to wrap their mind around that many years ago. But um, picture a climate that was like modern day Costa Rica with a lot of braided rivers flowing through it. These trees that are fossilized that we see today were kind of like sequoias that you might see in California. They don't have any modern analog, though. None of these species of trees are like, you know, a white pine or a ponderosa pine. Yes? Are these monkey trees? I heard something about that. Um, you know, I again, they have scientific names of how they've categorized what the trees are, but we don't have something to really compare them to today with any degree of accuracy. They just looked vaguely like and were roughly the size of sequoias and redwoods thank you yeah you bet if i could stay on track without my notes that's the real for notes um and and as we move forward i was just going to show you some of these historic uh photos in the upper right we have some early chinese ware that was pretty common in north america at that time um let's see to go in order lower right is uh El, uh alfred uh, Alfred. Albert Einstein and his wife visiting the park um, in the 30s. And then you come around those two photos on the left go together, actually. Um, there were huge CCC camps there that were helping build the park in its early days. And that one that's showing the camp there in the upper left is at Puerto Pueblo, if you know where that area is. And I show those captain's bars, that insignia down in the lower left, because we just found that that last year. It was pretty cool. They only had one captain in that camp, so we were actually able to trace it to the person and the family yeah. and let them know the story. Yeah. Turns out the captain's quarters had burned down. I'm assuming he lost his uniforms, and we were able to find his captain's bars. Wow. That's amazing. 80-some 80, 80 years later. And that's Hunter's forte they, there, Dave. I'm sure you know that. So, Yeah. <laughs> And Hunter, we're referring to as one of the other archaeologists, and he's particularly interested in this historic period of the park. Yeah, we've had some great conversations. Wait for that to change. It's changed on my computer. There we go. Um, so again, as we move back in time, uh, uh, another often overlooked type of resource or archaeological site are historic native sites that you may not think of them as an archaeological sites, but they're these early Hogans. I used the one on the right to show one where families were actually occupying it. And you can see that one's made out of logs. Um, and the one on the left is more of a stone structure that we have dozens of those throughout the park. Um, primarily Navajo families using them for a variety of ceremonial purposes. But um, again, I think this was lost in my notes, but as National Park Service archeologists, we essentially treat the painted desert in the same as we would treat a uh, stone tool lithic scatter. They're all considered historic properties or um, historic sites, um, even if they're more prehistoric in nature. We administer them all the same way. 
This is a cool one to me um, because this is one of those few times when an old paleontological location ends up becoming a historical archaeological site. Uh, Annie Alexander, that this camp was named for, as you can see in the upper left, was there in 1921. And um, in 19, excuse me, 19, in 2022, I went back and did a little repeat photography. And you see the landscapes changed very, very little, uh, at least the skyline. You could see in the 2022 in the background, a CCC parking lot and things had been put in after her camp. But Annie's particularly important in paleontology because she went, not only was she an early female scientist out there doing these things, but she went on to actually found the Berkeley uh, Zoological Museum and the Berkeley Paleontological Museum, which are really world renowned today. But again, it shows how we have a little bit of blend where paleontology and uh, archaeology can sort of overlap. And that site still has the occasional historic artifact that erodes out of it. So again, we maintain it and I shouldn't say maintain, but we go out and do condition assessments on it just like we would any other site. And then we go back to something we're a little more familiar with probably. We have amazing rock imagery at the Petrified Forest. In fact, I've been told we have more petroglyph panels and more images within those panels than Petroglyph National Monument in New Mexico. Um, for those that may not be as familiar with rock imagery or rock art, we call it, or petroglyphs or pictographs, the upper left is a solstice marker in action, uh, marking the seasons, maybe when your growing season might begin or end, things like that. And you go across the top, uh, animal motifs, of course, are really, really popular in rock imagery. As far as, hey, there were big horn sheep over this way, you know, they can demarcate any number of things, but hunting grounds, uh, fertile uh, water sources, things like that. Um, and then as you go down to the lower right, you'll see that's a pretty darn accurate depiction of a faced ibis for any birders that might be in the group. Um, and I won't pretend to know what he's harvested there. It looks like a little man, but I'm sure it's an exaggerated lizard or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. Frog. <laughs> yep. And then as you go to the left, we have a flute player with exaggerated feet, which is a pretty common, common thing that you see. And uh, rock imagery can be tough to date, but we certainly have images that would go back and I would say would cover the, roughly the last 2,000 years or so. The solstice calendar you said it's mm -hmm. in action is that because of the shadow going across yeah you have you're gonna have you, you know uh summer solstice right when it's bisecting it like that and covering up half of it how big was that that they can come in all shapes and sizes great question that particular one is roughly the size of a 12 inch vinyl record <laughs> oh Okay. So they had to sit there and watch that shadow go by <laughs> more than once to figure out where they're going to scribe that rock. Yeah, you're talking about people with a level of intimacy of knowledge of their landscape that none of us oh. probably would comprehend very well. Yeah. Where your whole life is on that landscape. There's a very fine line between being indoors and outdoors. You know, you imagine, no, these are obvious things, but you imagine no artificial light other than your campfire, your cooking fire. Um, everything was about watching the stars, watching the moon, watching the sun, watching weather events uh -huh. and the changes in the seasons. Especially when you're out in an environment like that, growing corn and melons and squash, you have to be a very advanced farmer. <laughs> Well beyond my skills. <laughs> and speaking of farming, as we go, I'm sorry. Did you have a question? Oh, uh, John, this is Steve Blythe. I was going to. Hey, correct. I was going to correct you. Pretty good. How about you? <laughs> good, good. Yes, I please correct. Gonna, me. I was going to correct you on the size of that spiral at Martha's Butte. That it's more like two and a half or three feet in diameter. Okay, then I totally, that, see, that's where my notes are getting me because I'm sure I said where that was from, and so I mistook which one it was. Thank you, Steve. And Steve joining us just now, Steve Blythe, is 
been with us, what, Steve, since 2017? Uh, 18. 2018 and is our rock art guru that goes out and records all these sites. So I don't mind saying he knows a thousand times more about those sites than I do. <laughs> I need his name and number. <laughs> <laughs> He's a, he's a Steve, great hiking Steve, partner. We're too. all aware of you now. <laughs> yeah, Steve's um, a great hiking partner. Thank you. <laughs> we look forward to having you back pretty soon, Steve. Hopefully soon. Yeah, about 10 days. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, so as we go a little bit further back in time with the human presence there in the park, we have what we consider the Pueblo period sites. Um, let's see if I can remember now what these are. The upper left is Puerco Pueblo, which is one of our common sites you can drive right to, uh, right near the banks of the Puerco River. Um, that site was occupied roughly up to about eight, 800, 900 years ago. Um, you can see there are some exposed walls there that saw some early excavation in the park as far as actually opening up big sites. Um, I don't think that's me. No, I think it's just <laughs> the office. And then as you go over to the right, you have some uh, animal bones that were made into whistles. Um, these are pretty cool because if you talk to Hopi cultural folks these days, they still use whistles just like that, just like these 900-year-old ones for hunting purposes. These were often made from wing bones and more often than not made from wing bones of eagles and some of the larger birds that would pass through the park. The lower right-hand photo is a really cool site called McCreary Pueblo. <laughs> um, and that's an ex that site is totally buried these days, but this was when a major excavation was going on in the early 90s, exposing some of those room blocks. And you can see there's some exceptional dry masonry in there. What is it covered up with? just covered up with ground. Like if you walk out there now, you'll see a little bit of undulation in the, in the landscape, but more or less it's just natural wind. And well, after this was excavated, it was still back in. The what? what? It was backfilled. Oh, right, right. They knew, they knew where these features were, if you will, under the ground and they excavated them. But when they were done with their research, they filled it back in. And really it's one of the best ways to protect the sites, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. And we're, this site's pretty fortunate in that it's not remote per se, but it's a pretty good hike to get over there. And um, it's, it's pretty safe, I would say. And then uh, on the lower left, you have a very, very cool ladle that I believe was from Parco Pueblo. Steve, if you know any of these things and I'm misquoting it, please speak up. <laughs> because I cannot see my notes. <laughs> Okay, I'll wait for that to change. But did anyone try blowing those 900 year old people? I'm sure they did. <laughs> I would not doubt it. And then some are actually a little more full blown flutes where you have the additional holes. So, this is a, as, again, as we go further back in time with human presence in the park, now we get back to the basket, make it, basket maker period sites. Um, these date, back to I think as early as about 2200 years ago. So they're getting fairly old. Uh, that big photo on the left is a slab lined pit house. And that's a very cool site called Sivuovi, which is um, in the Southern half of the park. These other images are also from that site when they excavated it, I wanna say in 1988, 89. Um, and what you see there are some storage cysts that were uncovered with complete vessels in them. I think there's a piece of brownstone there in that upper right-hand photo. And then you, then those are storage vessels. Some would be for catching water. Some would probably be for storing grains and whatnot. And then as you go to the lower right, you can see after those vessels were removed and cleaned up and, and uh, photos were taken in a lab. The basket baskets were made out of what? You know, uh, baskets were made out of a number of things, but I think one of the more common was yucca fiber. Wow. Um, and these sites too, I probably didn't explain this very well, is those pit houses or semi-subterranean houses. 
So in a, that hot, dry environment, you're more or less underground. And so you have that really nice thermal regulation, whether it's cold out or it's hot out. They're not very big. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head exactly what the diameter would have been of that particular house, but they're pretty small. Uh-huh. Be a little family unit that would be in there. A lot of yucca to make baskets. And the further you go back in time in general, then it was a little bit wetter, a little bit wetter. So you'd have more grasses, more willows, more things that would be yeah. make good raw materials out of the vegetable matter. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is on its way back. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, there's a quite a delay in me changing my slide. Okay, there we go. So this is a photo courtesy of Wapaki National Monument over near Flagstaff, north of town there. And it just starts to show the period that I'm going to talk a little bit more about tonight. You can see the San Francisco peaks in the background. Um, but you see folks in the foreground there with spear throwers and what would have been roughly Clovis age uh, points, which date to roughly around between 12 and 13,000 years ago. And you'll see a lot of critters that we don't see out there today. There were horses, camels, and I'll get into that a little more as we go on. Because as I mentioned, animals are kind of my thing in archaeology. Um, but these are folks that archaeologists tend to refer to as Paleo-Indians. It's folks, that, roughly groups of people that lived from about 8,000 years ago back to, we don't know, and I'll get to that, but you've heard about the finds at White Sands. Yes. It just keeps getting pushed further and further back. When I was in college, it was a nice round 10,000 years ago was when people <laughs> uh, got to North America from various other places. Now it's easily back. We have sites even on the East Coast that are firmly dated to 16 and 19,000 years ago. Um, and then White Sands, it sounds like they have solid dates back to 22, 23,000 years ago. So it's literally doubled in my my time doing this stuff. And then uh, you saw in the title, you know, the Pleistocene era in, uh, in our park. So what is the Pleistocene? It's usually we're referring to just the most recent ice age that ended roughly 10,000 years ago. Um, you'll see there, it is a geological epic. It, it was pretty long lasting from two and a half million years ago back to 11,700. We'd still tend to round it to around 10,000. It's not a perfect, perfect science with that one. Um, but these are approximately what the big ice sheets look like that covered, well, you can see all of Canada, Greenland, a decent chunk of Southern Alaska, and even down covering all of the Great Lakes states. Arizona was not under those ice sheets, um, but it certainly would have created a very, very different environment with that amount of massive ice sheets. So much water was locked up into these ice sheets that the shorelines throughout the entire world were, or I should say the sea levels were 300 feet lower than they are now. So to give you more of a spatial view of that, that would mean if you're in New York City today, that shoreline would be 60 plus miles out further to the east than it is now. So a lot more land was exposed. Um, that make, was, that's a long time. It that's is. Two and a half million years ago to 11,000 Well, and it's important to mention that there were a lot of, again, my notes, uh, I think there were somewhere in the neighborhood of five or six different glacial advances. So it wasn't always massive ice caps during the Pleistocene, but they would ebb and flow and ebb and flow. There wasn't um, carbon emissions and stuff. Yeah. It, yeah. And I won't, I won't get into that discussion. <laughs> but yeah. It's, no, no, no. You, it is important to mention we're just in one of those periods now where it will come back around. So, well, assuming that the planet hasn't been changed. John, I have a question. You bet. So, okay, so we're talking about the Ice Age, but we also yeah. know that the Colorado Plateau was underwater, petrified forest was underwater, swamp area. How, how does the timing of that fit into this? 
That's a great question. And I'm going to uh, take the easy way out and say I'm not a paleontologist. So I don't know that, um, I don't really know the time frame of that other than there was an inter, what do they call it? Intercontinental seaway that was in the Arizona area. But my understanding is that was gone by maybe more like 80 million years ago. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe 60, but it was in the millions, tens of millions of years rather than in this period. Okay. Yeah. Be because I mean, don't they talk about the petrified wood mm -hmm. being 200 million years ago? Correct. Which yeah. Those almost everything that you see as far as um, wood in the park dates between around 215 and 220 million years okay. ago. Okay. Which is okay. not a number that an archaeologist can understand. No. <laughs> I, I know. I, I can't comprehend the time, but yeah, I try and remember some of the numbers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. And so then, as we continue to talk about these Paleo Indians, how on earth did they get here? <laughs> they didn't originate here. They moved here from somewhere else. Um, and we'll look at this map and discuss it again a, a bit. But the easy answer is we have no idea. <laughs> we have people, as you can see from the map, that think that they maybe followed uh, the ice shelves and could have come from the areas roughly where we would think of Portugal and Spain being today and come across an Atlantic crossing where there would have been a lot more ice to follow. So there's, there are theories out there if you're hunting seals, for example, on the coast in what's today Portugal, you could actually follow uh, the ice shelf all the way around to what is North America. Mm -hmm. That's probably arguably the most controversial, one of the, the three big ones. Um, then you see the ice-free corridor up there kind of in the middle of coming from Alaska, well, Russia to Alaska and then down through Canada. That one doesn't have a lot of evidence to support it. We, the problem with that one is we find really cool artifacts in eastern Russia and western Alaska. And we find really cool artifacts down roughly in the area where we are. But we don't find anything in that ice-free corridor. Um, or not much to speak of, I should say. And so the one I think currently, again, we don't know, but the one that probably holds the most water is that Pacific Coastal Route. Um, because it's a much, much shorter distance. You're following a really, really ecologically, biologically rich uh, coastline. Uh, you know, folks that lived along what would today be San Francisco Bay Area, they had easy, they just had every, it was so bountiful um, that following that coastline would have made a lot of sense. Um, I did want to point out while we're looking at this, too, if you see where roughly where Russia would segue over into Alaska, I think we most of us probably know that was called the Bering Land Bridge during that time. Land Bridge, to me, is a little bit um, misleading because at its peak, there was a thousand miles from north to south of land exposed. So if folks were walking across that or animals were migrating across that, they didn't feel like they were on a bridge. It was just a continuation of whatever continent, you know, they were moving to or from. And I know that's a lot of information, so don't, <laughs> don't hesitate to yell at me if you have questions. But it's really a, really a very cool thing. I, I've been an archaeologist for almost 25 years, and um, we don't really have an answer to this migration, early initial migrations to North America any more than we did 25 years ago. We have a lot more cool evidence, but it, the evidence doesn't add up to making any sense. For example, sites, there are lots of sites in South America that are older than the ones in North America. So how does that work? <laughs> um, we have way more Clovis sites actually just around the Chesapeake Bay area on the East Coast than we have anywhere else in the country. So that doesn't make sense if you're thinking of Pacific Coastal Route. Yeah, and then one of the trickiest parts is, like I said, we used to have maybe about 60 more miles of coastline on each side of the continent. When that went away, guess where all the archaeological sites are now? Hundreds of feet under the ocean. <laughs> so the evidence is, is tough to come by. Wow. <laughs> 
can't even find the Titanic. How could you find it? Float the right, exactly. No, people have done a little, little bit of dredging stone tools, so things are there. But it's very, very tough, uh, costly venture to try to ease that stuff out. So if we go now to that Paleo-Indian period, um, I'm going to talk primarily about two major Paleo-Indian periods. And again, if we're going back in time, the first one we hit that's a major, major one is the Folsom period. Um, named after Folsom, New Mexico, because the first site uh, that they found with these types of spear points uh, was found very near there. Um, if you look at that lower left-hand photo, that is a really cool picture of the actual first known Folsom point ever found. It's still lying between two ribs of a prehistoric form of bison that no longer exists. Uh, these date to around 11,500. Gosh, this is why I wish I had my notes. Um, and you can actually see that whole block there with the sediment and the ribs in the point at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It's right there on exhibit. And this is a really, really big watershed moment for archaeologists because this took place in the 20s. And up to that point, no one had any reason to believe that people had been on this continent more than maybe four or 5,000 years. And this pushed it back to 11,000 plus. And then archaeologists, paleontologists had no idea before that point that people overlapped with now extinct fauna. They didn't know they overlapped with mammoths and, and saber-toothed cats and all those things that we're aware of today. So it was a big, big turning point in the research that went back that far. And then if you look at that map, you'll see a lot of uh, the central part of, of North America. Sorry, mine's half covered up, so I want to make sure you guys are seeing everything. Those are all Folsom concentrations, places where isolated Folsom points have been found, Folsom sites that have multiple points have been found. And you'll see kind of a theme there. They're in mainly just in the Rockies and on the plains. And that's because for whatever reason, all the Folsom peoples really, really just focused on bison hunting. And so that's where the bison lived. And they stretch, as you can see, I believe all the way from Southern Canada down into Mexico. Um, I actually brought some point casts of some of these, so remind me to get those out when we're done. <laughs> Just so you can pass them around it and see that some of these are quite small. Okay, so we go back to the next really famous Paleo-Indian complex or period. Sorry, yours did not change yet. There we go. Clovis points. I'm sure most of you have heard of these. They make the news. They're interesting. Um, to a lot of folks, they're really, really beautifully made. These are, it took highly, highly skilled artisans to be able to make these things. Um, it's not easy, as we, we call it flint napping, it's not easy to nap stone at all. Um, if you look at that really, really big red point kind of in the middle, you'll see those flake scars go from one margin all the way to the other. That is incredibly difficult to do with a, in a controlled way. Um, you'll see a lot of variation in the size of these. A lot of what that is, it wasn't that they were made smaller or made bigger. Most of them started out quite large and they would be resharpened, resharpened, resharpened. If, if they didn't break in a hunting event, you would just keep resharpening until they became the size of a couple of those ones on the top row. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll see, this is a really cool map that shows different Clovis locations in our state. We have some really well-known bison kill sites down there in the south, like the Leaner site and the Murray Springs site. Um, some of the really most famous ones in the, in the whole world. We don't have a lot of mammoth kill sites to speak of. So we don't know really even know how, how common of an event that was. Even though the Clovis people were walking around with these huge spear points, when we actually do find their sites, and there's good preservation. We find rabbit bones, turtle bones, score, you know, prairie dog bones. So they weren't just these, that image of the big game hunting really isn't that accurate. They were hunting big game, but they were hunting everything. everything. 
survival. survival and a varied diet. Who wants to eat the same thing over and over? Okay. And I put these stars on there. I think the stars are coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just because I happen to have casts of those three exact points. So I'll pass those around a little bit later just so you can get a feel for what they really, the size of them, the thinness. Uh, again, I, I flint napped a decent amount in my life and I couldn't begin to make one of these. <laughs> see. So actual, an actual Clovis and Folsom site. The, it's not coming up, but there we go. The Rainbow Forest site is a site in Petrified Forest National Park. It's really, really special. It's because it's for two main reasons. It's what we call a multi-component site, which means there were a, at least two or more totally distinct different time periods that the same site was occupied. So if you a modern analogy would be if uh, uh, someone had a farmhouse on an exact site 100 years ago, someone builds a modern house on there today, just because it's a fabulous location, right? Well, they, there were Clovis people at the site and there were Folsom people at the site. It's also very unique because it's an actual Clovis and Folsom encampment rather than just isolated projectile points, isolated spear points being found out on the landscape. This is where people were actually camping. And we know that because, and I'll show it on the next slide or two, we actually see where it was a workshop. They were making these points there. They were hunting there. They were at least there for, I don't know, a week or more. They were camping there. Um, and it's the only known, currently known, Clovis encampment on the entire southern Colorado plateau. So it's quite unique. This little playa, um, with the weather we've had um, last year and this year, you know, it stays pretty filled now. So it's a really cool location where you can imagine... Um, I'll just say this, we have sort of an adage in archaeology where if it's a cool place to camp now, it was probably a cool place to camp a thousand years ago or 10,000 years ago. So 13,000 years ago, this was a cool place to camp um, because not only would all the bison and things be drawn in by all this amazing short grass prairie around it, but it's a wonderful water source in a place that even back then would have been pretty arid. Um, it would have drawn in water birds. We, we still occasionally see some wading birds and things in this playa. Um, How big is it? Ooh, that's a great question. Oh, I should have seen that one coming. Uh, it's a it's pretty good size. Gosh, Steve, do you have any idea, or Dave, um, if you've been out there, roughly what the diameter of that playa might be when it's filled to that extent? I, I haven't been there. No, oh, I okay, okay. I haven't either. Okay, sorry, sorry to put you on the spot. It's no. it's pretty good size. It's it's significantly bigger than this room. I mean, based on um, the grasses, based on the grasses there, it looks like it's you know maybe what seventy to, to hundred yards across. I don't know. That's what I was yeah, going to guess. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's a good number. It, it it's it's good size and. There has been some research done there in the past that suggests that it was bigger in area and that maybe it was spring fed. So it would have been actually filled a lot more than we see it today. So people were drawn there for the animals, drawn there for their own fresh water for drinking, cooking, of course. Um, it's a really commanding view up there down over what's called Jim Camp Wash. It's very, you can see all the way down to the White Mountains from here. You're a really great view out over the little Colorado River Valley. So if you're a hunter, you'd be able to see movement of game. Excellent location. And then to make it even just a little bit better, um, there's outcroppings of petrified wood within just a couple hundred meters of there. And so people were there for the raw materials as well to make all of their stone tools. I put this in there just to show that we can recognize Clovis period sites from more than just those really cool spear points. It's the type of flaking. If you remember how I mentioned that one big stone point, the flakes went from one end to the other. That's called an overshot flaking technique that you see in the lower left. 
And it's because it's going from one to the other and actually going enough that it curls a little bit around the other side of the point. We have pores there that people would have knocked little blades off of um, for what archaeologists just refer to as just expedient little tools. You knock a little blade off of that pore and you, you have a tiny little knife you can use for any number of things. Um, end thinning flakes, uh, those were just so that the, the hafted or the part of the spear point that would have been connected to uh, a spear shaft, that way you can haft it better. And actually, it would have been wrapped with sinew so that it stays on there. And then I just wanted to point out, you know, beyond that, there, we have a pretty good number of other Paleo-Indian artifacts that are usually just isolated points that we find out on the landscape. Again, more Clovis, more Folsom. That Folsom was probably broken in hunting because it's pretty common for the tip to get knocked off. Um, and then one kind of called the Hellgap point, which is a, just a totally different style, a little bit newer. It still dates back to, I think, around eight, 9,000 years ago. So it's certainly not modern. Um, it's not petrified. That particular one is not. And I'm glad you brought that up because we're trying to figure out what that one is made out of. It seems to have little fossils in it, but I showed photos to our paleontologists and they said they'd actually have to see the the real deal to be able to analyze it under a microscope, but it's it's one of the ones that's not petrified wood. The other spear points are from petrified wood. Mm -hmm. And we do get points that are made out of obsidian, different types of chert or flint, but um, petrified wood is where it's at when you're in that location. <laughs> and you do find uh, stone tools made of petrified wood all the way down near the Mexican border, so people knew about that source and were I think, pretty enthused to get it. Not all of it, in my understanding, I'm not a stone tool expert, um, but uh, not all petrified wood was sort of created equally. Uh, some of it, you can work a lot better than others, but we have some really high quality stuff in, in the park that people seem to be very fond of from the number of tools that are made out of it. And this next one is just showing some of that. Here we go. You can see actually some of it is very visually pleasing too. You can see why you get names like Rainbow Forest up there because it's beautiful. And I have to imagine that some people were drawn to it because they knew they could make tools that looked a little bit nicer, a little bit cooler than some of the ones maybe their neighbors had. And these, these are a little bit later points dating to the last few thousand years. And then that's just showing, that right-hand photo is just showing how you'll see some of the wood there. Various um, sections of huge tree trunks. I promise I changed the slide. Oh, there we go. Um, this one, of course, is not a depiction of, of petrified forest, but I wanted to just show it because one of the big, big things as we move further back to this time period is just how different the environment was, was really getting from being just on the tail end of that ice age. So you had a lot more evergreens, you had a lot more standing water, the little Colorado and the Puerco and other woods would have flowed, you know, a lot more regularly than we tend to see them today. Um, and then because of that, more grasslands, and it would have drawn in more big herbivores. Uh, we would have seen the, the mastodons, the mammoths, those prehistoric. I'm sorry? Is that a dromedary? Uh, where are we looking? Behind the mask, way in back, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I will actually, that's a fantastic question. And there will be a slide that covers just the camel. <laughs> <laughs> there really, there is. Well, there were a couple different prehistoric forms of camel, and I will, I promise I will get to that. I don't want to kill the slide before I get to it, but, um, but yeah, a whole suite of animals that we don't see today, but also overlapped with ones that we do see. And as this changes, um, we'll see, as the title suggests, these were all animals that were right here in Arizona. A bigger form of wolf, uh, bigger bison, 
actually an American lion. We had our own lions here in North America. Some uh, native horses in the background. Uh, ground sloths were fairly common. Saber-toothed cats um, and, a, and a form of mammoth. Again, I'm going to do a slide actually on a lot of these individual species, so I won't say too much more than that, but some huge, interesting animals. Huge. And you'll see just how huge. So horses. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I keep lamenting not having notes, but horses um, evolved here in North America. There were many, many, many different species of horses through the last uh, 20 million years. Um, we had our own horses, the Pleistocene horse uh, that went extinct roughly around 11,000 years ago. And so any of the horses we see today were brought by the Spanish in the 1500s because our native horses didn't make it through whatever killed off all of these Pleistocene critters. Um, and then I threw in a photo of, I've been fortunate to work specifically with some of these fossils. Um, that happens to be from Alaska when I was working up there, but there's part of a horse skull that um, would have belonged to that species. Um, really widespread. They, most of these species, um, like these horses, you would have seen them from Alaska down to Mexico and from the West Coast to the East Coast. Very widespread, a lot of grasslands to uh, accommodate them. Uh, mammoths. Oh. My slide. There we go. <laughs> uh, most of us are probably most familiar with woolly mammoths, but the mammoths that would have been around in our neighborhood here in Arizona were Columbia mammoths. They were significantly bigger. Uh, if you look at that lower left-hand photo, that is a mastodon in the front and then an African ele elephant in the middle and then a Columbia mammoth in the back. So they're huge. Um, I actually had dimensions for you, but I do not remember them. Uh, Look at your notes. <laughs> I know, I know. Where, where are my notes? Um, uh, of course, a depiction of the skull up there in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, interestingly, when the mammoths were first starting to be discovered by paleontologists, they actually thought they were a cyclops uh, because of that opening up and all that is where it accom accommodates the trunk um, <laughs> where it connects. And then there's a picture up, up there of me working uh, with a woolly mammoth from Alaska. That's just the upper leg bone, the humerus. Is, it was huge and very heavy. Wow. It was, it was waterlogged, too, which didn't help. What bone is that? So that would be, if you imagine it being on all fours, it's this upper arm bone or the upper front leg bone. Of the bone. Something that oh, that's a I'm sorry? Try to clone them out of cow. I don't know about the cow, but I know that they are. There are people that are pretty adamant about trying to bring some of these things back. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on to your camel here. Dromedary. Camels have two homes. But what well, I guess when I say camel, we're talking um, scientifically, mean. taxonomically, they're in the camel family. Yeah, yeah. Um, like and so. You'll see it there. All camels we see today actually evolved from ancestors in North America, and then they spread to Asia and other oh, other places. Oh. Kind of cool. Um, then they were brought back. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like that photo because that actually does look like some of the you know northern Arizona grasslands that we see today. That lower right hand photo is an excavation of a prehistoric camel over in Waco area in Texas. But just to prove that we these fossil sites are around us, this isn't just stuff that I'm interested in. <laughs> They're actually a proof that they were here. Again, these were pretty widespread. You find camel remains um, throughout much of North America. Oh, I did. Before, I'm sorry. Before I go all the way to that next one, hopefully it will go back. Yes, that's okay. I'll tell you while we're on this one. Um, it, so we do have some camels still in the Americas, if you know domestic llamas, or if you've heard of Wanakos and things like that in South America, those are members of the camel family. So they were really closely related to those ones that we would have seen here 11,000 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. And then those ground sloths. 
they were pretty common. That depiction in the largest photo is a drawing of or a painting of them in a cave in the Grand Canyon. They're really well known from caves in the Grand Canyon. They've even found caves that were totally filled with their dung. So you can reconstruct their diet really well. And um, we have a specialist that works with us at the park who's, that's his thing. He's the world's foremost prehistoric uh, sloth expert. <laughs> um, they came in a ton of different sizes, but the Shasta ground sloth that was common around here, you can see down there in the lower left, was maybe about the size of a large black bear. Wow. Um, pretty good size. And over at White Sands, I don't know this, this exact species, but they have the footprints of these mm -hmm. guys. Have you been to the Grand Canyon Cavern? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a ground sloth they found in there, and it's in the museum in Flagstaff. Oh, now. really? Oh, I'll have to check that out. And some of the claws, too. And so I probably should have said this about a hundred slides ago, but the reason I go into this is because one of my biggest fascinations in archaeology is that, that humans overlapped with all of these things. Right here in Petrified Forest, right throughout all of Arizona, they were overlapping with these critters that now just seem almost like mystical animals. Mm -hmm. um, they were hunting them. They were living next to them. They, in some cases, they were probably trying to outrun them <laughs> um, like this. Guy, it will come up in a moment. Uh, the short faced bear, uh, let's see if I can remember statistics. I think the average grizzly today weighs somewhere between five and 800 pounds, and these guys got up to 2,200 pounds. Ooh. There's a picture of me in the lower left at the Idaho Museum of Natural History with an uh, articulated skeleton of one. You can see the Pretty giant. And you weren't running away. <laughs> weren't running away. Uh, one of the few safe ones. Uh, and then the upper right was uh, again. It happened to be an upper upper arm bone of one that Sierra and I over here actually were recording in Alaska together. Mm -hmm. And there's still not a ton known about this species of bear. They think that it was a fast runner. Um, and instead of maybe fishing or, or uh, foraging like a lot of bears do today, they think this one actually would run down its prey. It has really long legs and a, and a snub nose, hence the name. I, I threw in the picture of Chasing the Ghost Bear because that just came out last year and was written by a, a journalist out of Arizona. And I, I helped him just a teeny, teeny bit with some stuff in there. So it's a, good, it's, a, it's a good book if you have, <laughs> have any interest in this in huge bears from the past. And then our lion. Um, they were bigger than African lions, but not by a huge margin. Um, recent studies have suggested, even though we've thought they were lions for probably 100 years now, <laughs> that they may be more closely related to jaguars. But either way, they were huge predatory cats mm -hmm. that were found throughout, again, much of the continent. And this next slide will show us the primary focus of those, those fulsome hunters, you remember with the smaller spear points, they went after the, what's known as bison antiquus. That uh, upper right-hand photo shows a bison antiquus on the left sort of compared to a modern bison. So they just had much, much bigger hump. I don't know the, what the purpose would have been for that sort of enlargement, but they were noticeably bigger, had a uh, wider spread in their horns. Uh, but those are found in quite a few, quite a few archaeological sites from that period. Seem to be they're just their main prey for whatever reason. And probably the most famous of these mammals, the saber-toothed cat. Yeah. Um, a really, really heavy cat. Again, I don't have my stats, but um, 
we we really really don't understand how they hunted or really grasped their prey with those super exaggerated um, canine teeth. They're really really prone to just snapping off if there's any sort of fork to them at all. Um, the the lower right hand photo is from the La Brea tar pits you may have heard of in Los Angeles. And it's what it's showing is just some younger cats where the canines are being replaced. You see there there's double canines next to each other. So their baby teeth are being <laughs> replaced by their adult teeth. And I just have to imagine that these were an incredibly scary animal to have around when you were wandering around Arizona, what you know, twelve thousand years ago. What is the red thing top oh, right? Yeah, so that is showing, all of it is the skull. The red is its jaw hanging down, and it shows how wide it could open its jaw to accommodate those really big canines. Wow. wow. But even so, it's still a pretty small gap for it to actually get prey in there. <laughs> yeah, get those. So... And I apologize for this image, but I actually decided to keep it in there because it shows how our depictions have gotten better over the years. This is a really unrealistic hunting scene, <laughs> people flinging stuff at this giant bison and overhanding things and being that close to it and all of that. But, but, where, did, but where did they go? And in, in, in all, again, <laughs> the quick and dirty answer, kind of just like the migration routes, is we don't know why they all died out, but we know all those animals that I just showed you and more were all just gone by a, around 10,000 years ago. There were isolated populations, for example, of mammoths that were on islands that did not die out that, that early. Um, but most of the huge critters just died out. And um, there's everything from suggested it's over hunting to environmental change where they just couldn't handle landscapes changing, vegetation changing. Um, and we don't have an answer. It's another one of the really cool questions in archaeology that some people are trying to answer. Mm -hmm. um, and then, okay, they, the short-faced bear died out, this bison antiquus died out, but why did our other bison not die out? Why did grizzly bears survive? Why did moose survive? There's a ton of large animals that did make it through elk. Um, so it's a big question. And then this next slide was, I think something I mentioned a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to, um, it serves as just a reminder that these animals did overlap very much with the animals we see today. And these are some of the more common mammals that we see in petrified forest and you see all around here as well. Um, yeah, so that, that big mule deer, you know, those mule deer, the pronghorn, the badger, they were all living right alongside the mammoths and the Shasta ground sloths and the saber-toothed cats. They were all there. So it wasn't some wholesale change where these animals all died out and then new ones appeared. So where do we look to find these? This picture just happens to be a really, really cool site in Wyoming called Natural Trap Cave. Mm -hmm. If you can see that picture well, you have to repel some 80 feet or further down into it, more or less a vertical hole that's just captured the, all of these animals we just highlighted for thousands and thousands of years. Their remains are down in the bottom of there. Um, but we aren't lucky enough in Petrified Forest to have a site quite like that. Um, so where do we look? Well, one of the places that we just started looking last year is, is that all the way open? <laughs> is, a, is a um, volcanic fissure that we have in the park that you see there on the left hand side and um, I believe I took this photo so that's some of my coworkers down on their hands and knees looking at the dirt on the floor um, we took a few samples out of there because ultimately what you need 
is either a real consistently dry site like that to preserve those old bones, or you need a really consistently wet site. So a lot of these fossils are found in Alaska because the permafrost and the, the ice has just kept them a consistent, um, in a consistent state for thousands of years. And so in Arizona and places that are arid like that, you're generally only going to find it if you can find a cave or a, you know, a fissure like this, that's very much just a cave like. Where's this in the park? That is in the northern end of the park, and that is all I am allowed to divulge at this point. <laughs> um, but, but we collected some samples from there. Uh, you see my little arrows, because then we spent weeks looking at these little samples under microscopes. And at least me, after weeks of looking through these samples, I came up with those bones that you see in that vial that was about this big. Wow. Um, now, to be fair, we only took samples down to a really shallow depth just to kind of see if we would find anything. So next year, or probably later this year, we'll go back out there, dig much, much deeper holes, see if we can hit any any bedrock under there, and we're hoping to find some of these really cool places to see. So those are critters. all volcanic walls? Mm -hmm. Yes. I want to go. <laughs> of course, as you can imagine, this is a national park, so we've, we've put bat recorders and things like in, that, in there to make sure if we go back in, we're not disturbing any of the animals that might use this for habitat. Um, we did find some swift or swallow-like bird nests in there and some things like that, but no evidence of owls or anything like that. So we have to be really careful that we're not disrupting uh, what it may be used for today. But we're, we have our fingers crossed <laughs> that we might find some earlier stuff. So far, we've found some bats, some lizards, um, some tiny little rodents and things. In fact, we sent these off to some guys in Texas that uh, specialize in microscopic remains like this. So we'll get a list back from them at some point. And where else? Um, when we're looking at this, this period back there, you know, 10, 12, 13,000 years ago, another place to look is some of these river or wash environments where you have these really cool cut banks like you see there, saddle horse wash. And so all that means is you're, you're getting to see some, some of the strata that would normally be buried. It's exposed. And that's why, for example, why paleontologists are, you always see them working in badland type of uh, environments because they're just able to see the strata that's not hidden, which is normally hidden underground. So we'll look at these washes. We'll look at the Puerco River. That's always its cut banks are always being cut back further, and and it's the right age too that mammoths and things like that may have been uh, buried there with different floods, and then floods will expose it, bury it again. And if you're there at the right time, you might be lucky with it. <laughs> And then we'll do further research back at that rainbow forest site on that playa. Um, no real excavations to speak of have been done there. So it's possible there are some buried deposits there. But again, it's such an open air site versus a cave. Their preservation probably wouldn't be in our uh, favor. Thank you. <laughs> I realize that didn't, that didn't pop up yet. <laughs> delay, delay. So is that a current picture of the Puerco River? That was from last year, but it, when I was there two days ago, it looked just like that. So that it may be. as well be. <laughs> <laughs> we were joking that we should start doing river trips through the, through the park. <laughs> but I really sincerely thank you all for having us and yes, having me, you. having my friend here. And um, we were be more than happy to come back. We'll discuss other topics. Um, and uh, yeah, don't hesitate for a minute to contact us if you have any questions, you want to come visit the park and maybe see if we can see some stuff. Um, yeah. Events once a week, they have a big, they go out, take people out once a week. That's a, that is a fantastic question. And before I leave, I will give you the name of the person that I would get in touch with for that, that really handles all of our scheduling for public related events. Yeah, Do they have a website or Facebook page or something similar? Mm, gosh, that's outside of my sort of my realm, but I believe a lot of it does make its way to Facebook. Um, you can start by checking our, our, uh, 
web page for the park. I'm not sure if it's kept as current as it could be, uh, but I can get you in touch, get her in touch with the person that would know and knows what is happening day to day. And thank you all sincerely for bearing with me without my notes. I hope it wasn't. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, but I'm going this year. Well, will I see you over there? Yeah. I'll probably be doing a poster up. So yeah. <laughs> Tim Flag's that, right? It is. And surprise, it'll be about animal books, in case you were wondering. <laughs> 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 now, what about people homes? I never, you know, they don't do anything about people. You're not allowed to find them, or what? Oh uh, no, that's a great question. I'll I'll say up front, it's a very very sensitive topic, but I don't mind discussing it. We um, have a park that is highly highly erosive, so as you can imagine, things are being exposed all the time, and sometimes those things are uh, native ancestral remains. Okay, so um, okay. We do. We work, me in particular, and our museum curator, we work really, really closely with the tribes, specifically Zuni, Hopi, and Navajo, but we have 36 federally recognized tribes that we work with overall um, to basically have what we consider a co-stewardship um, approach to how do we handle these things um, without going into too much detail. Sometimes it's, you may need to uh to protect the remains of an individual maybe you move them a little bit over where they're not eroding out anymore in some cases maybe they're in a really remote location so it's more appropriate to let them as my hopi friends would say just continue on their journey back to the earth um there are a lot of different approaches that different cultural groups have and we're incredibly sensitive to that and do our absolute best to accommodate everybody um yeah so yeah it is uh, i'll be blunt it's a pretty common occurrence actually yeah and we, we have sites that we know are more prone to that so we periodically check them and see what the status is and see if we need to take care of any of that so these are like burial sites correct not just people keeling over correct <laughs> correct more like i flashed through it rather quickly but the pueblo period sites in some of those basket maker sites. You can imagine if you have a small Pueblo uh, village, if you will, that yeah, you're gonna be burying your folks kind of right there nearby. So. Hey, John, a question. Yeah, that's for... really, absolutely. Um, do you wanna say anything about the self-guided wilderness hikes that you're promoting? Um, I picked up the pages the other day from the, the visitor center. I think I've got eight here. Um, I don't know if everybody knows about these, that they're available, that people can take these self-guided hikes by picking these up. I didn't know if you wanted to say anything about them. You, you may actually know more about it than I do, Dave. I, I okay. will say we, we try, I'll just give a quick sort of intro to it. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. We are, in my mind, a fortunate park in that we have an open backcountry. We have a couple sensitive areas that the public um, probably are not allowed to go into, but by and large, in our roughly 140,000 acres, the public can go out there and hike. And for day hikes, you can just go out there and you can wander and you can enjoy the landscape and see all the amazing features. If you want to go out there overnight, we have free backcountry permits that you get right there in the visitor center. So you can go on a backpacking trip for a couple nights or more. Um, but what Dave is, is primarily alluding to is we have these really cool uh, self-guided hikes out into some of those areas where they're not super, super long, but it gets you off the beaten path, gets you away from the sidewalks and some of the crowds. If not that we have a ton of crowds usually. Um, and generally and you came from there, Dave, because I honestly, I don't know a lot of the details of if there's GPS involved or or how that goes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at these in front of me now. Like I said, I've got about eight of them. They range from about two and a half miles to eight miles. If you want to go out to the clam beds, it's like eight and a half mile round trip. Um, they provide GPS coordinates of the highlights. Um, they have a map that kind of shows the trail that you would follow. A lot of photos in these handouts are typically two to four pages. 
So it kind of helps you find the location. So, um, I mean, these are great. I'm looking forward to researching these a little bit more and taking some of these hikes. Um, and, and, you know, this is kind of, I think, where we can share that the site sewer programs coming into play in that we are going to help the national park monitor these sites now that they're getting um, more visibility and more people accessing these areas to make sure that we're identifying any vandalism or things that could be changing with the site. So that's kind of the partnership between the site sewer program and the national park that we're really looking forward to. But anybody can go to the visitor center, look through these, pick one they want to do, uh, and follow the follow the guide, which is really informative. I'd, I'd highly encourage it. Yeah, that's fantastic, Dave. Thank you for bringing that up. And again, to just bring it full circle, I feel like we're really lucky because a lot of national parks, you kind of have to stay on trail, stay on the sidewalks. And right. lots of times those are for good reason. But as Dave was just describing, in our park, you can really get out there and explore it and explore it on your own. You don't have to be guided. You don't have to have someone uh, looking over your shoulder, per se. Right, right. I'll, I'll also make a comment, um, John, that, that you spelled archaeology in a couple of places here inconsistent with the park's recommendation spelling. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, my whole life is going back and forth of pulling that second egg out of there or putting it back in. <laughs> so I don't know if you all are familiar with this, but the much more common spelling is what you see right there, A-R-C-H-A-E-O. But in the official spelling in the Park Service, it's just E-O without that A. Um, <laughs> right. And if you're an archaeologist, you just flip back and forth between those things. Because, for example, I'm always helping our... Um, our partner uh, association that puts out pamphlets and things like that and uh, runs our bookstores. And the first time I did something with, with Tara, I don't know if you know Tara, but she, she said, why are you spelling it? Just EO. And I, I go, don't worry about it. Put the A in there if you want it. I, it's a long story. <laughs> it's a federal <laughs> government thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was way above my period. And <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, great presentation. Thank you, John. Oh, thank you, David. We really, we really look forward to seeing you guys out there more and the help that you guys are going to give us is just priceless. So. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, John, I think that's oh. a fantastic uh, talk. One more question. Yes. Well, it wasn't a question. I was just going to add on to what uh, Dave mentioned. If anybody's interested in guided hikes, uh, check out the uh, Petrified Forest Museum Association website. Yes. And, are, and those, I should, are, are those the ahead, ones that are just, just happening to March, or do they continue into the summer? I'm not sure of their schedule. Uh, I noticed they were on hold for quite a while mm -hmm. due to COVID. Right. Uh, Dave, um, I think uh, Victoria said they will start them up again in the fall, probably oh. September or October when the weather cools off a bit more. Okay. And right okay. now they're involved with school kids doing uh, uh, you know, educational programs for school kids. So that must pretty much occupy the times of those, those uh, people. Okay, great. Thanks, Carol. I do have a question, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, okay. please. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the repatriation, and I just wonder if there's anything that the museum or the, the Petrified Forest Park has. Do they have any items that are subject to repatriation? Sure, that is that is a fantastic question. So what he's referring to, if you're not familiar, is we have a Native American Graves Protection Repatri and Repatriation Act that came out in 1990, I think it was. And um, that... Uh, uh, what was the right word I want? That directed uh, for repositories, federal agencies, uh, universities, all kinds of museums to no longer hold on to all of their Native American actual human remains and also related funerary objects. So if something was from a burial or thought to be from a burial, those go back to the appropriate people. Um, we have had a number of those items and we now 
don't believe we have anymore. And if I, I sound like I'm questioning is just because some items we don't know if they would be considered funerary objects or not. Um, so we are having the Zuni and Hopi and others actually come right into our museum collections with us and uh, help us out with that. <laughs> okay, that's great to know. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. Erin, did you say something? No, um, that, they, it got answered. Okay, great. <laughs> and I did, I guess, one really quick last thing I wanted to point out. It's limited numbers, but I've come up with a new overnight trip that I'll be guiding um, the last day of September, first day of October of this year, I think we limited it to eight people, maybe 10 people, um, just because I'll be the only, probably the only guide on it. Um, we'll be going out into the Painted Desert and visiting various archaeological sites and camping out there overnight and enjoying the night skies. Um, what else did I want to say about it? Uh, it's through the Petrified Forest Field Institute. So if you look up the Petrified Forest Field Institute, You'll see me on there as an instructor or a guide, and uh, you can look up the, it's called the Lithodendron uh, Overnight Archaeological Tour. <laughs> Great. So look for that coming. Thank you, guys. This was awesome, and I look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. With, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, end the meeting, and thanks for everybody that joined through the Zoom. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah. Thanks, Richard.